Hi, I'm <laughs> the associate pastor here at church. That was Brandon, our lead pastor, and it is a pleasure to, to work with him and, and under him. But for those of you who have not met me, yes, my name is Daniel Lanning, which is the same as the new coach at Oregon. And no, I don't know him yet. No, I don't know if we're related. But yes, I was here first. So... <laughs> for whatever that's worth. So um, <laughs> it is my pleasure to be here with you this morning and to, just to get to spend time with you guys and be in this space. So thank you for being here and joining us. Thank you if you are here joining us online as well. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you guys and to, and to get an opportunity to share. So if you've got your Bibles this morning, we are going to be continuing in Mark chapter 5. We are going to be finishing chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 21 through 43, the whole section to end chapter five today. There are two really cool stories there that we're gonna take a look at. But before we dive in, let's go ahead and pray and ask God's blessing on our time together. God, I thank you. And I just pray that you would be here with us. Lord, speak to us, uh, quicken our hearts, open our ears, help us to hear from you and receive from you. God, I just pray that today would be an experience of your faithfulness and your goodness in our lives. Open our eyes and help us to see you clearly and help us to receive what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So the last few weeks, we've been looking at some stories in uh, Mark where Jesus is starting to stretch his disciples a little bit, and we've seen a few themes that are going to get repeated here this morning. We've looked at some stories that involve these themes of fear, of loss of hope, but of faith in the middle of those things. So I've titled the message this morning, Faith in the Face of Fear. Faith in the face of fear. So a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Brandon spoke about the story where Jesus and the disciples were crossing the Sea of Galilee and a big storm comes up and about their response to that moment, how they dealt with fear and loss of hope and Jesus' faithfulness in the middle of that. Last week, they talked about the story that happened on the other side of the lake where they encountered a man who was dealing with some significant um, spiritual oppression and spiritual torment in his life. We're told that he was possessed by so many demons that they were referred to as legion. And Jesus sets this man free, casts the demons out, and it's about the, the blessing of God on his life after that point. Um, but he deals with, and the community around him, deals with a significant amount of fear and of loss of hope and yet the faith in the face of that. And this week, we're going to look at two stories that deal with those same themes. So they've come back across the lake and we are going to pick up reading in chapter 5. Let's start by reading verses 21 through 24. The Gospel of Mark says this, Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. And Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. So we open the story this morning with Jesus and the disciples coming back across the lake and getting out of the boat, and they are immediately met by a crowd so large, it's described as like pressing in around them. And here again, we see Mark in the language that he likes to use. Remember, he's, he uses a lot of immediacy in his storytelling. Right now, immediately, so then this happened, and then this happened. As they were doing this, this other thing happened. One thing after another, there's a sense of like almost breathlessness to his storytelling because it's so many things happening one after another after another. So they get out of the boat. There's immediately this crowd. We're not told geographically exactly where this happens, but most scholars think that it was in the area of the city of Capernaum, which was sort of Jesus' home base. It's where we know that Peter had a home and his family lived, and it's sort of the central location they spend most of their time at. Because this is a location where the people clearly know who Jesus is. They're familiar with him. As soon as he gets off the boat, they are ready to go. They're like, this is Jesus. We want something from him. And they're all pressing around. And the first thing that happens, this crowd is there. And we're introduced to this man, this character named Jairus. And we're told that he is the leader, the ruler of the local synagogue. Which is interesting because it identifies him as a man of authority and of leadership in the local community. His role, more than likely, was to organize and orchestrate the weekly church services that they would have at the local synagogue. He was probably the guy putting the order of service together, making sure that the building and the facility was maintained, and exercising a degree of authority over the physical place as people were getting together. The synagogue for the Jewish community at that time was a lot like churches for us today. 
where every Sabbath on Saturday they would get together, there would be a reading from the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures, there would be some sort of a homily, one of the rabbis would share their thoughts, things like that. There were a lot of similarities, and this man, Jairus, is one of the leading authorities who is in charge of that local synagogue. We don't know if it was the synagogue in Capernaum or wherever it is, but this community that they're in right now, this man locally is clearly well-known and identified as a leader in the community and as an authority. But what we do know about this man is that he has reason to believe that Jesus can do something about his daughter's situation. His daughter is dying. We don't know the nature of her illness, but the word that is used here for dying is a word that means on death's door. She is not doing well. She's suffering. We're told later in the story that she's about 12 years old. So she is young, and this man is desperate. And he comes and he throws himself at the feet of Jesus, begging for Jesus to do something. Whatever this man's experience with Jesus has been before this, whatever he's seen from Jesus, whatever he's heard from Jesus, it has been enough to give him reason to believe that Jesus can do something for his daughter in this moment. So let's go ahead and continue reading. Mark chapter 5, let's read verses 25 through 28. And it says this, a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them but she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe for she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Here's another thing that Mark does in his storytelling periodically. He'll start one story and then he'll sort of interrupt it with another one. And then after the interruption, he'll return to the story that he started with and he creates sort of this literary sandwich. He does it a number of times. But as the crowd is traveling, as this press of people is moving toward Jairus' house to help with the situation with his daughter, we're told that there's a woman in the crowd who has another medical issue, something that she's been dealing with for 12 years. And she's pressing her way into and through the crowd because she too believes that Jesus has an answer for her situation. We don't know much about this woman, but we're told three things about her. We're told that she's been bleeding for 12 years, some sort of a hemorrhage, We're told that doctors haven't been able to help her, and in fact, they have made her condition worse. And we're told that she has a reason to believe that Jesus can heal her where all her doctors have failed. So let's take a look at these things for a second. There's so much that we can say about her story and so much nuance and so many interesting things going on here. We're not told what her medical condition is. There are a number of things that could cause what's being described for her, but most scholars agree that it was probably related to her monthly cycle, that the bleeding is, has something to do with that and something has gone wrong and the bleeding is not stopping for her. Regardless of what's causing the bleeding in her case medically, we know some of the impact that it would have had on her life and some of what would have been true for her because that kind of bleeding would have uh, left her according to the laws that were told in the Old Testament. She would have been considered what the Jews called ceremonially unclean. That's a phrase you'll hear sometime. We've referenced it a couple of times in the Gospel of Mark already, and it's kind of a big dramatic phrase, but basically what we understand is that in the Old Testament, God gave the Jewish people certain rules, and he said, When people come to the temple to worship or to offer sacrifices or when you gather publicly uh, in a church service to worship together, I want people to come with a certain level of cleanliness. I want people to come with a certain level of, you know, having taken care of themselves. And he listed off a number of very normal life circumstances, okay? Becoming ceremonially unclean wasn't some, it was a thing that happened to everybody just in the course of life. Sometimes it's easy to read scripture and see these stories because It's often associated with significant illness. And it's easy to think that like becoming ceremonially unclean was this huge social taboo. But the truth is that becoming unclean for them was really, really common. There were a number of things that would cause it. And basically what the Old Testament says is if one of these circumstances happens to you, you need to take a bath and wash yourself in a particular way, change your clothes, wash your clothes, and wait for a period of time, and then you can resume normal life, okay? Honestly, it's not significantly different from most of the normal modern. You guys ever interacted with like a middle schooler or something when you're like, oh goodness, you need to leave and go take a shower and wash your clothes and then you can come back, okay? (laughs) There are some similarities there, okay? For any middle schoolers in the house, I apologize. That's not me being judgmental. That's just me thinking out of my own trauma, okay? So... (laughs) But what happens when you get a situation like for this woman, okay, where the issue causing her uncleanness does not go away? 
what happens if it persists, okay? Her, her status of being ceremonially unclean, it would have been very difficult or impossible for her to function in a normal way in her society. She would have dealt with a number of pretty significant changes to her normal life and even changes and restrictions in the way that she interacted. She would have been prevented from bringing sacrifices to the temple. She would have been prevented from engaging in public worship. It would have put boundaries on how she could physically interact with other people because one of the things that we know is someone who was ceremonially unclean by shaking hands or hugging somebody else, you can make them ceremonial unclean, and it could have been inconvenient for the people around her. And so there would have been an impact on how she engaged in the public life of worship of the Jewish people. There would have been an impact on how she engaged in the lives of the people around her. It would have caused certain degrees of rejection and isolation that she would have had to deal with. And ideally, in the Old Testament, when somebody is ceremonially unclean, it's not necessarily like, it doesn't mean they're a bad person. Okay, this is not a statement of like good person, bad person, but sometimes in the psyche of the Jewish people that did creep into the way that they thought and to the way that they treated people. And we're not told exactly what she had to endure and what she had to go through, but we can assume that she's had to deal with a certain degree of that, of that rejection and that isolation. So she comes to Jesus at this time. The second thing that we're told is that she has seen every doctor that she can. She has spent all of the income that she's getting on these doctors trying to get help, trying to be healed, and no one's been able to help her. In fact, we're told that they have only succeeded in making things worse. And I'd like to point out that in this moment, this is not an indictment of the medical community, okay? It's possible, yes, that some of the doctors that she had gone to see were charlatans or hucksters and were trying to take advantage of her. That's possible. But it's just as possible, and in fact more likely, that she's been to see legitimate medical professionals, and the problem is that her medical issue is just beyond their ability to do anything about, right? that they've been in good faith trying to care for her, and they're just, there's limits to what they can do. Because that's true even now, isn't it? Yeah. I'm so grateful for the world that we live in and the advancements and how God has blessed the modern medical community and the doctors and the kind of scholarship that we have available, because the things that can be accomplished through the medicine that we have access to are nothing short of miraculous. Okay, the kinds of surgeries that can be done, the kinds of medicines that can be leveraged, the kinds of things that we can do to care for people are incredible, okay? But even with that, there are some limitations on what we can accomplish through modern medicine and what doctors can do. I know for myself, we've all got stories of how our lives have been impacted by medical situations and the medical community around us, but I am constantly reminded of the birth of my first child because I, as Brandon joked earlier, am not small, okay? I'm, I'm six foot four, 250 pounds. I'm just, I'm a big guy and I have big kids. If you've ever met my children, and my first son, when he was born, uh, turned into a bit of an emergent situation that it was, I think, 36 hours of labor and he was not coming out because he just wasn't gonna fit. He was too big. And things, the, the labor was stalling and it was starting to cause complications. And I remember the doctors coming to me and saying, we need to step in and we need to do an emergency C-section, which was not, not what my wife and I had planned for the birth, but was welcome to hear because I was getting very, very nervous and worried in the moment. And as soon as they said that, I said, yes, please. I want my wife to be healthy. I want my son to be healthy. And I think back on that event, and I, I obviously can't look at that and say, you know, things would have gone differently, but a hundred years ago, I probably would have lost them both in that moment. That, and I think about that, and I am so grateful for the availability of medicine like that and the skill and the ability of the doctors to step into my situation and to help like that, and now the life that I'm getting to experience because of it. Okay, but this woman has gone to see doctor after doctor after doctor and she has come up against the limitations that they are experiencing in their medical capabilities and they are not able to help her. And I'm reminded that sometimes medical conditions are simply beyond the ability of any human to do anything about, but the good news is that no situation is ever beyond God's ability to do something about it, amen? The third thing that we know is that she believes Jesus can do something about her situation. We don't know what her exposure to him has been before this. She's in the area, around the community, but something that she's heard, something that she's seen, something that she has experienced has left her convinced 
that Jesus can do something about her situation. She says, if I can just get close enough to touch his robe, I will be healed. That's what she's believing in this moment. And so she presses her way forward. And let's go ahead and continue reading verses 29 through 24. Immediately, there's that word again, the bleeding stopped. And she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. I love this moment, right? Because this miracle has happened. She's been healed immediately and she knows it. And there's an expectation that Jesus recognizes something in this moment as well. And and I love this moment. It's easy to sort of read this story and to think that he's upset or angry. And I don't think that's what's going on at all. I think Jesus knows that a miracle has taken place and he wants to affirm it and identify it and call it out in front of people. And he wants to acknowledge what God has done in this moment. And it's a little bit humorous because this miracle, I don't want to say that it happens on accident, but it does happen like unintentionally kind of. Jesus is not even a conscious participant in this moment, right? This woman presses her way through the crowd and she touches the hem of his robe and the healing happens and then he becomes aware, oh wait, something happened. And he turns around to figure out what's going on and of course there's this humorous moment with his disciples where he says, who touched me? And his disciples are looking around saying, Jesus, we've got 9,000 people packed into like this small air. Everybody has touched you so far. There's not a single person here you haven't bumped into, you know. But Jesus knows exactly what he's asking. He knows exactly what he's looking for. And so he's looking around for this woman. And I love this moment for her. We're told the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And we get to see this picture. Here is this moment where she is experiencing fear, right? I mentioned that that word has been a theme in the last few stories, the boat crossing and the storm, the man at the tombs and dealing with the community after Jesus sets him free. And now in this woman's life, we're going to see it again here in a minute with Jairus and his story. But this woman is experiencing a moment where she is dealing with fear and she has a choice of how to deal with it, how to interact with it. She can let this fear push her away from Jesus or she can let this fear draw her closer to Jesus because we see both of those responses in the pages of scripture. Okay, those are both responses that we see from people and I'm so grateful and glad that in this moment she chooses to draw close to Jesus. She is afraid and that fear brings her to him. There are three takeaways, they're in your notes this morning that I wanna highlight and this is the first one that I wanna call out this morning. Fear is a normal part of life. It can cause us to run from God or it can draw us closer to him. Fear is a normal part of life. It can cause us to run from God or it can draw us closer to him. And the encouragement this morning is that in those moments where we are dealing with similar situations, where we are dealing with fear, the encouragement is to follow the example that she sets down for us and use those moments to draw close to Jesus, to cling to him, to come to him, not as excuses to push him away. And I love Jesus' response to her in this moment. He turns and he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. He turns to her. This woman who is used to being pushed away, rejected, and dealing with isolation, because remember, she's demonstrating a tremendous amount of boldness by pushing her way through this crowd to touch Jesus, because one of the things that would have been true is as she touches the people in this crowd, they are being made ceremonially unclean as well because of her condition, and she's daring enough and bold enough to push through that and to touch Jesus himself, okay, She's used to being rejected and told that she can't do things like this. And I love that Jesus turns around and he doesn't care about that at all. He's not concerned about that condition and what it might mean. He turns and he uses this term of familiarity, of intimacy. He calls her daughter. Here's this woman who's been pushed away, who probably hasn't experienced a lot of intimacy, who probably hasn't experienced a lot of close relationships and a lot of being cared for in the last 12 years. And Jesus uses this term of family, familiarity, and intimacy. He calls her daughter. And then he praises her faith. And he says, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be free from your affliction. 
And then he sends her away, and it's this beautiful moment where Jesus affirms what God has done in her life and what's happening there. You guys are okay. Don't worry about it. (laughs) He praises her faith, and I want to take this moment right here to look at that word faith because faith is such an integral word to the biblical narrative and to the stories that we deal with and what's going on. And there are a lot of ways to try and understand it and, and to define it, but I read something this week that really struck me, and it's so relevant to her story and what we see here from her life. And so I want to draw it into the conversation this morning. So this is takeaway number two, okay? Faith is our response to God's faithfulness, and it is sustained by God's faithfulness. Sometimes it's easy to think about the word faith, to think about this idea, because it's intimately related to the words for believe and trust as well. That faith is this process of learning to trust in God, learning to believe in him. And it's easy sometimes to end up in this place where I think my ability to have faith, my ability to trust is something that I have to just conjure up on my own. I have to create it out of nothing and to sort of blindly just trust in God. But I love because this is a reminder right here. We, our faith is an act of response to the work that God is already doing in our lives and the world around us. Amen? That our faith comes out of these moments where we see God move. He does something. He demonstrates his faithfulness, his goodness. And faith is the response that is birthed in us because of that. And then it grows as we continue to keep our eyes on his faithfulness. As God continues to be himself, as he continues to do what he does and to demonstrate his goodness, our, our faith grows as we keep our eyes on that. Both of these people, this woman dealing with the bleeding and Jairus, whose daughter is about to die, both of them have come as a response to the faithfulness of God that they have seen in the life of Jesus already. We don't know what they know, but we know that they have seen or heard something from Jesus that causes them to believe he has the answers that I need. I am trusting in that and trusting that God is going to do something through this man to take care of my situation. And for us, that becomes part of our conversation as well, that when it comes to understanding how do I have faith, how do I grow my faith, those same elements are there. Where is God's faithfulness? Where is he moving in your life? Let's go ahead and continue. Let's read in Mark chapter 5, verses 35 and 36. He finishes this moment with the woman after her healing, and now the story continues. While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the synagogue leader. They told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith. And here's our second moment in this story where we see fear come in. Jairus has just gotten the news that his daughter is dead, and people are assuming nothing can be done any longer. Death is pretty final. And so they come to him and they say, don't bother the teacher, you're just wasting his time now. Go ahead and let him go on his way. And I love the words that get used here. It says, but Jesus overheard. And my Bible has an asterisk and a footnote, and it says that word for overheard can also be translated as ignored. So Jesus heard them and chose to ignore them, And turned to Jairus and said, don't be afraid, just have faith. I love it because there's this moment where Jesus is like fingers in his ears, la, 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 can't hear you, can't hear you. We're going to go ahead and we're going to do a miracle in this girl's life anyway, okay? And Jairus and his wife in this moment have a decision to make for themselves because they are now being confronted by fear as well. They are dealing with this moment and they have an opportunity to listen to what they're being advised and to say, Jesus, I'm sorry, there's nothing you can do. Why don't you leave Or they can respond to their fear by drawing close and listening to what he has to say, by continuing to trust in what they know about him and in what he is leading them into. And thank goodness that they choose to trust in him and to follow him in this moment. So we continue the story. Let's go ahead and look in uh, Mark 5, verses 37, and let's read up through 40. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead, she's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave and he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. 
This is an understandable moment, but we're getting a look at a cultural distinction here, that what we see, the loud weeping and the wailing in their house, is very normal as a part of the grieving process in their culture. There are many cultures still in the Middle East and even in the Eastern world in general, where grief is a very public, communal thing, that when someone passes, this is what you do. In fact, we're told at this time, there were professionals that you would hire to come in and grieve the loss of your loved one, professional actors who could come and wail and mourn, because that was part of, as a community, how you processed loss and processed grief. It's very different from how we do it here in the United States, isn't it? That for us, grief and loss are usually much more private. And there are good things and bad things about both sides of this and both ways of doing it, but this is very normal for them. And Jesus comes into this circumstance where they are in the appropriate grieving process, and he stops with this curious answer. And he says, why all this commotion and weeping? Like, he doesn't know, okay? The child isn't dead, she's only asleep. And they have a fairly understandable response. They laugh. They can't take him seriously. They're interacting with this moment, and they, because of perspective, because of what they have seen or haven't seen, they can't trust in what he is planning to do. And they are engaging with this moment where they're putting distance in there. So let's go ahead and read to the end of this. Verse 40, the crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave, and he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Reasonable responses. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened, and then he told them to give her something to eat. And I love this final verse because there's a degree of practicality there that makes perfect sense and a degree of impracticality there that baffles me in this moment, okay? I love the command to give her food right? Because medically, whatever has happened to this little girl, she's just been through a lot and she needs something to eat. She needs to recover, right? 12-year-olds are notoriously voracious even to begin with and ones that have just come back to life from the dead. I can only imagine how much more so (laughs) they need to recover, right? But the other thing he says, keep this quiet, don't tell anybody, baffles me a little bit because how are you not going to say anything about this? I mean, I get it. This is a recurring theme in the early chapters of Mark, right? That Jesus is trying to control or interact with how much people know about him, his degree of notoriety, his degree of fame, and the things that God is doing. But people knew that she had died. She's going to leave the house at some point. They're going to see her. And there is going to be this moment of cognitive dissonance where they say, wait a minute, I heard that she was dead. And yet she's walking around, you know, doing things and being a person. I don't understand it. They're going to go to her parents, and what are her parents going to say? I'm sorry, I can't tell you. Jesus told me to. (laughs) I don't know what things look like for them moving forward after this, but it just seems like a slightly baffling command. I I know there are good reasons for it, but, uh, but it is interesting to me. But what I love about this, throughout the whole course of the Gospel of Mark, we've been coming back to this question, who is Jesus? And looking at how the stories in Mark answer and address that question. And I know that for the three disciples Jesus took with him and for this little girl's parents right here, that question has gotten some new answers to it, hasn't it? These are moments that they are not going to forget easily. They are not going to let go of these stories and these experiences. And it is informing those moments for them. And this leads me to the last takeaway that I want to give you guys this morning. And it is this. Hopeless circumstances are transformed as we keep our eyes on and learn to trust in God's faithfulness. Hopeless circumstances are transformed as we keep our eyes on and learn to trust in God's faithfulness. This is what God does. He takes moments and circumstances that to us seem irredeemably hopeless and he transforms them into stunning examples of his goodness and his grace. He steps into the middle of our stories. He brings his goodness and his faithfulness and his power with him. And he does things that we could only scarcely believe in. These are people who have trusted in Jesus. They have placed their faith in him. And they have kept their eyes on him and what he is doing. And they are seeing increasing examples of God's faithfulness moment by moment by moment. The process of learning how to have faith in God is the process of keeping our eyes on his faithfulness. Our faith starts as a response to the good things that he has done, and it is grown and sustained by keeping our eyes on him and what he's doing. 
How many of you discovered in your life before that if you want to think more about a particular thing, if you pay attention to it more, you will think about that thing more? Anybody ever encountered that before? Like a song that gets stuck in your head or something like that. The things that you fill your vision with, the things that you fill your mind with are the things that are going to dominate your thinking. So if you spend your time filling your vision, filling your sight, keeping your focus on things that scare you, things that take away from your ability to trust, things that are hopeless and heartless, like so much of the news anymore, unfortunately, then it's going to impact your thinking. It's going to impact the things that we dwell on. It's one of the reasons why the Apostle Paul, later in the New Testament, in Philippians chapter 4, he's going to write to the church and he's going to say, God has peace for you. And if you want to experience his peace and stay in his peace, then fix your mind on the things that come from him. Anything that is good or noble or right or wonderful, and think about those things. Keep your focus on those things, and it's going to keep you in a place of being guarded and, and experiencing that peace in Jesus. It's one of the huge benefits of reading scripture regularly because we have story after story of this sort of thing in the life of Jesus and in the lives of the other characters throughout the history of the nation of Israel. And it's all designed to give us opportunities to see God's faithfulness and his goodness at work in the lives of people. But there's another reason why being able to recognize this process is important. You see, this idea that our faith is built on and sustained by God's faithfulness reminds us that sometimes in life, it's easy to lose sight of God's faithfulness. And if my ability to trust, if my ability to breathe, breathe, believe, is predicated on his faithfulness, his goodness, what happens if I can't see that anymore? What does it do to my faith if I lose sight of his faithfulness, of his goodness? Because that, so much of what is going on there is what happens to us when we do start to lose faith, when we do start to lose hope, when it becomes difficult to trust in God, it's so frequently associated with what we've been focusing on and where our eyes are. Because I don't want to lie to you this morning, there are going to be lots of things in life where it is hard to see the faithfulness of God. It is difficult to see God's work in certain moments of life. It is difficult to feel like God is demonstrating his goodness sometimes. And it is going to leave us in a space where we feel a little bit lost and a little bit empty. So what do we do with moments like that? How do we respond to those moments of fear in ways that will draw us closer to God instead of sending us running away from him? So I want to point us back to the three takeaways and again remind us that this is a process we can consciously engage in. Fear is a normal part of life. It can cause us to run from God or it can draw us closer to him. And it's about that moment of what am I going to do with Jesus right now? Every moment is an opportunity to push away from him or to draw close to him. Even last week, we saw the story of the man with the demons cast out of him. And we're told it's a wild story, right? But we're told that the demons go into this herd of pigs nearby and the herd of pigs rushes off a cliff into the ocean and drowns. It's this crazy, crazy moment. But afterward, the, the swine herds, the people who were taking care of the pigs, they're terrified and they come to Jesus and what's their response? They go to Jesus and they say, please leave. We don't want you here anymore. They have this moment of fear and they use it as an opportunity to push Jesus away. They say, go away, leave our community. We don't want you close, okay? And for us, we have those moments where we need to decide how are we gonna respond. In a couple of weeks, in Mark chapter six, we're going to return to the story of John the Baptist. Some of you may remember him from the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. We're going to see what has been happening in his life. And he is dealing with some very difficult circumstances. And he's in the middle of one of these moments of fear. And he's going to reach out to Jesus. And he's going to ask for some help. And Jesus is going to give him an answer. But it is not the answer that he is hoping to hear. And we're going to get to watch John navigate this moment of fear and uncertainty as he looks for the faithfulness of God in his life. Faith is our response to God's faithfulness, and it is sustained by God's faithfulness. Pay attention to what you're focusing on. Are you looking for God's faithfulness, or are you filling your mind with other things? And again, the last thing, hopeless circumstances are transformed as we keep our eyes on and learn to trust in God's faithfulness. He has the power to transform any situation into something much better than we're anticipating. He is capable, and he is good, and he is a faithful God. Amen. And as we end this morning, I want to remind us one last thing. Jesus didn't go into this situation alone, and he called three of his disciples to go with him, not just one. Because one of the things that will always make faith harder, one of the things that will always make the process of trying to see God's faithfulness harder is when you're isolated. 
When you're alone, when you're cut off, when you are removed from a relationship in your life, it is always, always, always more difficult to see what God is doing, and it is always more difficult to trust in him. It's one of the reasons why relationships here at church, one of the reasons why we champion life groups so much is because we want to create environments where you can interact with the people around you and you can process moments like this. You can talk about this stuff. You can get it out of you and say, here's what I'm feeling. And if you're afraid of doing that, let me give you a point of encouragement here, okay? There is a book in the Bible right near the middle called Psalms. There's like 150 of them. And have you guys ever read one of the Psalms and the psalmist has been doing this processing their inability to see God's faithfulness. They've been talking about how absent God feels. Have you ever been made uncomfortable by reading their processing of those moments? Because I certainly have. That you read these stories and you're like, oh my, you're not allowed to say stuff like that in church. You can't talk about not seeing God or dealing with these emotions or whatever. And not only did they say it, they took it and they turned it into the national hymn book of the country of Israel. These were the songs that they sang in church, talking about these, these, these deep hurts that they had in this process of trying to see God's faithfulness. And over and over, you read from David and the other psalmists about moments where they can't see it, moments where they feel cut off and abandoned and alone. And they ask the question, God, where is your goodness? Where is your faithfulness? Because I can't see it right now but they're talking about it with the people in their life. They're sharing it with their community and they always come back and they cycle back around and they say, yet still I will praise your name because I know that you are faithful. I know that you are good. I will place my vision. I will place my eyes and my focus on you and on your goodness. And they've set the example for us in these moments that as we journey along the journey of faith, as we walk the journey of faith, we get to do the same thing. We get to engage with the people around us and we get to keep our focus on the person of Jesus and on his faithfulness and goodness, amen? Let's go ahead and end this morning by praying. God, I thank you so much for this time, for this opportunity, for the stories that we've read about here, for the example of this woman, for the example of Jairus and his family and of the faithfulness of you and of your son Jesus in these moments. And God, I pray that you would keep our eyes on those moments of faithfulness. Birth in us that sense of trust, that sense of belief, that sense of faith in you that says, I have seen God be faithful before. I will trust that he will continue to be faithful. God, please help me to see the new evidences of your faithfulness in my life and the lives of the people around me. God, be in those spaces with us. Help us walk into those places with you, staying close to you. And as we do, Lord, I do pray for transformation in our hopeless circumstances. In the things that we are dealing with this morning, in the baggage that we came in and brought with us, God, help us to see your transforming power work in those moments so that miracles can be done and people can see you yet more clearly. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.